All right. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Vera Hokkanen, and today I will talk about concept art in Returnal from my perspective as a senior concept artist working at Housemark. So like the title suggests, I will talk about our creative principles and how they affected the art direction and the visual development of Returnal. And throughout the whole presentation, I'll be showcasing a variety of concept artworks ranging from environments to VFX done during the production of Returnal, along with my personal opinions of each work. So naturally, I will start by introducing Housemark, my concept team and myself. There will be a short overview of our game Returnal, if you're not familiar with the game to basically tell you what we did. After that, I will talk about our pillars of design because they will explain to you why our game looks the way it does and why did we make certain decisions. And once you know about our uh, design thinking, we can talk about those principles applied in the practice and more practical part or the hands-on work of a concept artist. And then we have a little section about our DLC called Ascension. And this is a bit more personal part of this presentation where I will mostly reflect on my own years and artistic journey at Hausmark. And in the end, we have conclusions and lessons learned. So first, a little bit about myself. Um, art has always been my passion. I'm a senior concept artist and I'm working at Housemark. And I have seven years of professional experience. And out of those seven years, five has been at my current company, so at Housemark. But before that, I spent two years in a mobile game studio called Do Dreams. And I saw two mobile games from start to finish. But despite this two year time period in mobile gaming, I felt like I went straight into the deep end of game development when I joined Housemark, since Returnal is actually my first console game. And um, yes, so I've been at Housemark since 2018. And this concept is actually from that time, so five years ago. It is from the first biome of our game called Overgrown Ruins. Um, so a little bit about Housemark. The studio was established established in 1995. So it's the oldest still running Finnish game studio. So we're based in Helsinki, Finland. And during Returnal's development, we had around 70, 75 in-house developers, give or take, because in the beginning it was considerably less. And in the end, it may have been a bit more, which is natural. And now we are roughly maybe something like 120 20 to 130 people. And our in-house concept team had three to four concept artists. And on top of that, of course, our art director, Ville Kinnunen, who deserves a lot of credit for the visuals of our game. And on top of these numbers, we had amazing coder partners to help Returnal make uh, possible. So last... Um, so in 2021, Returnal was published, it was received well, and soon after that, we became part of PlayStation Studios. So I'll be showing you um, trailer of our game, because it's easier to show you what we have done rather than tell about it. So let's see if I can put it here. This is from 2021. Come on.
And do I get this one? Thank you. Ah, so um, Returnal is a fast-paced third-person shooter and roguelite video game featuring psychological and cosmic horror elements in a dark science fiction setting. So if you're not familiar with roguelite games, they are basically games which the player experiences permanent deaths meaning if you die in the game, you have to start it all the way from the beginning. But roguelites like Returnal also have some elements of progression that separates them from roguelike games. So now that you know the basics, uh, I'll talk a little bit about the context of our production, since we had multiple challenges when we were making this game. Returnal was actually the first third-person shooter and the first roguelite game in Housemark's history. And besides this new genre, we were also developing into a completely new platform, so PlayStation 5. And to make things even more challenging, we were developing and publishing the game during the COVID-19 pandemic. And from my artistic point of view, I would say science fiction is also quite challenging to design. We couldn't use as much real world references or actually even older games or IPs that we could build upon. So everything needed to be designed from scratch. So it's quite fair to say that it was a challenging or ambitious project for a relatively small team. But the challenges were, were well worth it in the end since Returnal was received well, and we won multiple awards after it got out. But to emphasize how ambitious the project was for Housemark, these were the games that we published before Returnal. So in 2017, we made Matterfall and Next Machina. They are both twin stick shooters, um, arcade titles with really stylized art direction. So to get from here, from very stylized games to the more realistic and serious haunting style of Returnal was a big growing experience for the whole company. So how did we do it? How did we get from the stylized art direction to the more serious style of Returnal? To answer that question, you need to know our pillars of design because they explain our design focus and goals in the production. So this is an important slide. Um, these are the core design pillars of Returnal. <coughs> so we have compelling narrative, roguelike variation, and housemark explosive action. And these three, three pillars together create replayability, which is stated as a goal in the middle. So everything we did including art, was to support these three core pillars because they were the guiding priorities that we had. So let's look each of these individually and see how they affected our visual development. So let's start with the first pillar, compelling narrative. Celine, our main character, is trapped on a hostile planet and she is trying to find her way out. The story is about loss and trauma in a very mature way, aiming to haunt the player. And of course, the visuals were heavily shaped around this principle, because everything that we show in the game also tells a story. So the concept here is from the first area of the game, and the mood is dark and eerie to support the narrative. Planet Astropos is unwelcoming and hostile, and this was empathized with darkness, rain, fire, and fog, for example. But however, in 2018, when I joined, um, the art direction was completely different than this. It was colorful, stylized, um, very bright, and kind of joyful. And to me, it felt quite disconnected to the narrative. But after our art director, Ville Kinnon and Join, we started driving towards this much more realistic style of Returnal. And it was a really good decision because it kind of leveled up our studio 
And it was what the game and especially what the narrative needed. So as the player progresses in the forest, they will encounter a house sequence, which is another good example how narrative impacted the visuals or how we told our narrative through our visuals, however you want to say it. So these are played actually in first person and little by little they reveal Celine's backstory on Earth. As you can see from these overpaint uh, concepts, the setup is quite dramatic. There's bold shadows, eerie mood, cold color grading, and atmospheric fog in order to tell a compelling narrative. Without spoiling too much, um, it tries to imply that something is wrong here. And creating this sort of mystery of what has happened here was one of our goals in the narrative. And just like the house sequence or environments or any other individual asset that we have, everything is somehow connected to the narrative. So for example, the alien race is very present throughout the game and it's scattered throughout the biomes that we have. We show their hieroglyphs, alien devices, architecture, and like these statue concepts here. But however, because our aim was to haunt the player, the alien devices that Celine encounters are actually hurting her. The architecture is brutalistic and cold, and the statues show agony and pain in her poses. And this was because with every visual element that we had, we trade tried to haunt the player. And when all these big, medium, and small decisions are made while considering the same goal, which again, in our case, was to haunt the player, it creates coherent and believable world building. So moving on, the second pillar of Returnal, roguelike variation. So since the player is destined to die multiple times because of our roguelike genre, we wanted to make every single cycle feel unique. We wanted to engage the player by um, changing the environments, threats, items and weapons that they may encounter. And having this feeling of exploration and discovery was essential to balance out the uneasiness of the world and the fast-paced action that we have. But from artistic point of view, however, creating these unique cycles is quite challenging. Returnal's world map is generated procedurally each time the player dies across seven different biomes. Um, so it is definitely a creative constraint because we had to have a huge, huge volume of levels to create these unique cycles. And set piece moments like shops or boss areas like this concept here became all the more important because they gave visual variety for the players missed otherwise a bit more generic biome content. So procedurally generated world also meant that in practice, um, we had quite a lot of restrictions for the environments. In the concept team, we were often concepting individual rooms all levels, um, which were confined within walls and doors, rather than seamless linear paths that could allow for more artistic freedom. And then we had things like randomized uh, global lightning and things like that. So we weren't always in full control of what the player experiences in the game. Well, you could say that it was still um, creating replayability because variation is essential for our game. So third pillar of our design, housemark explosive action. Like you may have noticed from the tra tra trailer, um, Returnal is a very VFX heavy game. There's a lot of bullets and explosions on the screen at the same time. And this is because housemark never forgot their arcade roots. But the explosive action actually also refers to our company motto, which is gameplay is king. 
And what that meant in practice is that the visuals and every other feature as well needed to support gameplay as that was one of our top priorities in our production. So in a game like Returnal, it also meant that the VFX needed to be concepted with very clear readability in mind. The projectiles and the explosions, etc., are all quite bright, big, and bold, how to say, inspired by the older arcade titles. And environments, on the other hand, had to be more darker and muted in comparison to create this easily readable contrast between the two. And that alone shaped the look of the game a lot. Because every area or biome you discover in the game is quite dark and grim. So we needed a lot of back and forth to nail down these bullet concepts because we were going back and forth between uh, more realistic and more cartoony bullets. And it was quite a bold choice to keep the uh, projectiles in such a huge role of the look, visual look of Returnal. But in the end, it makes Returnal stand out from the crowd of games. So the right side has effects concepted for the Tower of Sisyphus. And in this case, the brief was to go as big as possible without sacrificing readability. And this was because we wanted to give moments of power fantasy for the players through the weapons that they were using. And the arcade bullet hell also meant that the enemy designs often needed to support attacks with a lot of variety in direction and scale. So we have enemies that shoot bullets in all directions or lasers coming out of their eyes. So a little bit different. But luckily, we were designing a cosmic horror game. So having monsters with very unconventional features or even like geometrical shapes was fitting to the team. And this enemy is actually concepted by my colleague, Jukka Rajaniemi, and then we made teamwork because I made the effect on top of his work. Yes. So to summarize, these are the uh, pillars of design. We have compelling narrative, roguelike variation, and housemark explosive action. And these three core pillars were shared among everyone in the project. But I also want to raise up two other principles that were shared within the concept team. So in a little bit smaller <coughs> circle. So the first one of them is the rule of cool. And basically it just meant that if someone made a concept or an idea that was just so cool and it resonated with so many people that it also often ended up in the game. And a good example of this is uh, tentacles on the monsters, for example. Because I remember in the pre-production, we added it to only one creature, but then everyone found it so cool that soon almost every creature or enemy that you encounter has some sort of tentacles in them. And one other kind of principle or feedback that was often said in concept team was to design maximum impact in mind. So for example, if I was to design a laser coming out of an alien's eye, I wouldn't tone it down, but rather I would think what would make the biggest impact to the person experiencing this effect, or what would make the biggest impact for the person viewing my counterpart. So it helped to make bold decisions, but this principle is of course used in the context that we were working on. So I'm not saying that you should always go as big as possible. So just be mindful of that, of course. So, okay. Now that you know the high level building blocks of Returnal, we can talk about those principles applied into practice and the daily work of a concept artist. So I'll show you a few different examples what my day-to-day -day work might look like. But before that, I want to remind you that concepting depends on 
a few factors. Like firstly, are we in the pre-production, are we in the mid stages of the project or in the later stages? And secondly, do we have creative freedom to explore something or do we have a really precise problem to solve? And thirdly, <clears throat> the time spent on a concept depends on how much feedback and iteration there is. Sometimes it could be years of work, sometimes it's a couple of months or weeks, and quite rarely something is perfect on the first try. So let's start with this example of years of iteration. Here's a concept artwork of the crash landing site in 2018. So it's one of my first environment concept artworks, quite old already. So the problem to solve here was the overall look of the starting area. I can see it's quite dark, so you might not see all the details, but anyway. The problem to solve here was the overall look of the starting area in Returnal and the mood and the general look of the first biome in our game in very general terms. Because in this stage, we were mostly focused on the high level plans. The concepts were usually built from scratch because there were nothing yet to be in the game or anywhere. The ideas were only spoken in meetings. So there weren't that many restrictions to ideas compared to the later stages of the project. Again, very dark, <laughs> but this is the crash landing site two years later um, after multiple iteration loops in mid to late phase of the production. So we already had the starting area in game and now a lot of our concept artwork was actually paint overs on top of the existing levels. So it is a cumulative process in which we polish and refine the visuals little by little over the years. And this time, the problem to solve in this work was quite different. I was to find the final details and go into the nitty gritty. So what would the mood and the vegetation, fire and rain look like? Another example of somewhere between mid-phase concept art, so overpaints of the fractured wastes biome. And this time the problem to solve was to transform gray boxed level blockouts to an actually ice looking biome. But this biome in particular was challenging because if you remember from earlier, we needed to create this easily readable contrast between bright projectiles on top of a darker environment. Well, it was quite challenging in a biome that had large areas of white snow. So it seems obvious in hindsight, but it took us some time to darken the overall mood of, the, of this biome. And another important factor while we were painting these overpaints that we had to be very loyal to the shapes that we were given from the level designers. So if you remember the motto that gameplay is king, it meant that we couldn't add trees or rocks or anything that might block the smooth gameplay. So that's why we have huge, large open areas in Returnal. You might have noticed that whenever we do concept artwork, there should always be a core problem to solve. And I'll show you two different examples, what those problems could be and how they might look like. Both of them are simplified and made up. But the first one, brief number one. Could you please make a barrier that stops projectiles and player progression? And then a list of requirements. It could be a, it could have videos or excels from or some form of documentation. Basically, it needs to be see-through, made of energy, it needs hit impact, colors need to be considered, and so on. So basically, it is a wall of text. And in this situation, I'll focus on creating a single solution. Not always, but often. 
because the brief is very precise and to the point. Everyone has a clear understanding of the needs and what we are trying to achieve with this feature. So in this particular case, uh, I will make this in a day and I give it for my lead for feedback. However, after the feedback, the concept has expanded the original brief. And this time there's a new request. Could you please make the same effect also work in shields, both in enemy and player shields? It gives a coherent visual look if we use the same style in multiple um, places and reusing work saves time. So I make another version with the hit impact and the breaking effect of the shield. And again, I return it for feedback. And again, it has expanded the original brief. And this time the request is, could you please get differentiation between organic enemies and mechanical enemies? And then I make this kind of wavy secondary motion for the organic enemies. So the point is to say that really the first version is perfect and having someone else's feedback is super valuable. And after this, um, the feedback or the iteration loop go, could go on. Someone might raise up a technical question about transparency. Someone might want to have a science fiction pattern on top of the shield or the colors could be changed. And I think they were changed to red to the final game. So feedback is often endless because, well, concept art is subjective and every department is more or less affected by the solutions that we are offering. Brief number two, um, completely opposite to the previous one. I call this the super loose one. So there's barely anything in the brief. And in this case, my task was to do player effects. And that's it. It could mean upgrades or sweet damage, malfunctions, basically anything. And the brief is more about exploring this topic rather than um, solving a specific problem. And in this case, you sort of know that nobody really knows what they want just yet. <coughs> And um, that's normal, it's part of the process. So my way of working on these types of briefs is usually to do multiple variations and different options because it gives like um, idea of possibilities and it can start a conversation. And often many of them won't be used, but it is just the nature of our work. So I worked on these images, um, but Ilmari Kumpunen actually made the character underneath the VFX. So again, teamwork. Yeah. And both of these briefs, like the super loose one and this explorative task, have pros and cons. So I'm not saying that you should only lean on one or the other. Very generally speaking, I would say that these explorative tasks are in the beginning phase of a project, and the further down you go, the more precise everything becomes. So this was the practical part of this presentation. Now I will quickly talk about our DLC called Ascension. So after Returnal was out, we started immediately working on this um, DLC. It added a new biome to the game called Tower of Sisyphus new story content, and multiplayer co-op. So here is my concept artwork of the top parts of the tower. And with DLC, we still had the same core design pillars as in Returnal. So housemark explosive action, roguelike variation, and compelling narrative. And because these big pillars were already in place, we could only focus on creating more content to the world of Atropos. And it made the process a lot faster as there was already something to build upon. So 
Personally, this was really rewarding time for me. I really loved making this DLC. Um, I could compare my skills from the beginning of Returnal to the beginning of DLC and see a huge improvement in many ways. Obviously, my art had improved. I used way more 3D. And I guess I felt more comfortable at being a concept artist. Also, our team had found like clear ways of working together. So everything was efficient and easy, so to say. So over the years, I sort of grew into my current position. If I had to pick just one, I would say environment concept art is my strength. But now a lot of the VFX concept art was or is also coming to my table. And rendering this quite detailed and precise concept has become my strength. So in a way, in a uh, much bigger scale, I kind of found my own place in the team. And here's a concept of the starting point in each cycle in the Tower of Sisyphus. So sort of like a lobby area, some sort. And the focus here was in the room layout, textures, materials, and lightning. And I felt like I had a bigger impact to the look of the DLC than I had to Returnal, because I wasn't as junior or new to the industry um, while we were making this DLC. It's natural, but it was just very rewarding to see. Uh, this is actually the last concept I have time to show. It's about the Tower of Sisyphus and an exploration of how it could change once you climb high enough in the tower. So I really enjoy the variety of the work that we do. Sometimes we do environments, sometimes we do VFX, storyboarding, environment, uh, <laughs> props, creatures, characters, and so on. So having this sort of variety keeps the work interesting, fresh, and fun. So the final section of this presentation, conclusions and lessons learned. So as a personal advice, I'd say that everyone could or would benefit from defining their own uh, pillars of design for their own game because they help you to make meaningful decisions and keep you in focus, to, uh, in focus of the core problems that you want to solve. And every person in your team might have a little bit different idea of this, so writing them down could be uh, beneficial for you. There was a lot of growth in Housemark as a game studio and also a lot of improvement in myself. There was definitely also growing pains in both, but I'm really happy to see where we stand right now. And again, it has been really rewarding to see over the years. And lastly, Returnal was born under multiple challenges. It was the first for many things for Housemark, but we overcame those challenges by defining our creative pillars and those guided the visuals to the best possible outcome. <clears throat> so I've heard people generally remember only one or two things from each presentation. So I hope that these two are the things that you walk away from here. So first, play to your strengths. As a studio, Housemark never forgot their arcade roots. It is our strength, it is part of our DNA, and it makes us unique. We also believed in our vision, even if there hadn't been that many roguelite games in the scale of what we were trying to achieve. But we also played to our strengths as individuals. So every concept artist in my team, for example, have very different skill sets. One is really good at making fast sketches. One is solely focused on making character designs. One is really good at making cool hard surface designs and so on. So every artist completes one another. It 
sounds cheesy, but this is my way of saying that diversity in skills and in people is valuable because everyone has their own strengths that they bring into the team. So, and the second point, communication is the key and especially between the teams. So whenever there was a design challenge, whether about the world, art, characters or whatever, the fastest way to solve that was to just sit down and talk it through with people. Often when the teams or people were living too long in their own corners or bubbles, the process became not as efficient as it could have been. And as a creative person myself, I would say that communicating with other people makes us inspired from one another. So keep the collaborative communication going. <clears throat> so it has been a pleasure to be here. If you want to see more of my work or my colleagues' work, you can find us on ArtStation or LinkedIn. Um, and if you're interested in joining Housemark, I would be happy to answer any of your questions. Or if you're interested about PlayStation, we have a booth in the expo area as well. So thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> I believe we have time for questions, All right? Hi there. Um, Hello. Uh, first of all, great presentation. Uh, love Returnal. I think what Housemark does is uh, well, tragically quite unique these days because I think arcade arcade shooters are the best genre of video game, and so I'm glad that you guys you know hold up those values. It's fantastic. Um, so my question is uh, really asking about your your process with regard to creating concept art. Um, you've got lots of beautiful artwork that you shared, but I was wondering if you could speak a little bit to the process for how you go about creating some of these concepts. You spoke about uh, working in 3D, particularly for the DLC. So I was wondering about the basically the pipeline for how you create concept art, that, in, that interplay between uh, 2D and 3D and how, that, how those slot together for you. Yeah, of course. Um, well, of course, it depends on the task. Is it environments or VFX, for example? For environments, I could use the existing levers from the game, or I could build the scene from scratch in a chosen 3D software that I do. And then just drawing in materials, textures, and lighting, and then painting on top of it. I would say it goes sometimes like 50-50 3D and 2D. Sometimes it could be less or more. So it really depends. Lately, I've been also like simulating VFX, so that's been fun as well. So I use that also to help in the process quite a lot. <laughs> also, to add that, I, uh, I do quite a lot of sculpting as well, but I don't do the retopo or any of those kind of slow processes because concept art has to be quite fast. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Thank you for the talk. Um, you touched a bit on this with the VFX, but uh, about concept, uh, environment concepting, how, um, how long do you have to iterate on it? Like uh, how much time do you have for this, uh, for a single concept, environment ah. concept art? And how many times during that uh, process do you go back for feedback? That's a good question. Uh, sometimes the piece could be easy and it could be done in a day. Sometimes it could be two or three days. Um, but for example, the concept team is quite, or we are all quite um, often in the office. So just asking my <laughs> kind of lead from the next to me for feedback is like very easy. So I would say we get feedback daily, easily, or even more if I just ask more. But there's no like set uh, time set in stone that you need to do something until this time or 
day or nothing like that. So it kind of depends on the task at hand always. Hello. Hello. I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> um, thanks for the talk. It was really, really interesting. Um, kind of similar question. Um, you mentioned about how you would get like endless feedback mm. um, for like concepts and things like that. I was just wondering if you had any strategies to help uh, improve that or to relieve like endless feedback and when to stop or anything like that or do you still struggle with when you know how long is a piece of string okay another good question um of course we like value every feedback that we get but nowadays we only have like few people that can give an action actionable feedback so if we have feedback other than these few people the feedback needs to go through them before we are actually doing the changes or pivoting or anything like that. So those few people are kind of managing the feedback for me. So I don't need to struggle anything or anyhow like that. A uh, really great talk. I've just got a personal preference question. Um, mm -hmm. So you went through sort of two different sort of creative briefs that you had before, and uh, one was really quite well detailed and very structured, mm -hmm. and then the other was just player effects. Mm -hmm. Which do you prefer doing? Do you prefer having that sort of structured, you know what the target is that you need to do, or do you prefer the other one where it's like, okay, I've got a lot of creative freedom with this? I really enjoy both. If there is a precise... Uh, documentation or brief it's really easy I don't have to think as much and with the more creative explorative task I basically get to do what I want of course I will be asking questions and clarifications for people so it doesn't need, mean that I'm just doing something solo no not at all but yeah I enjoy both of them I would say at the moment I really yeah, I enjoy both. I can't really decide. So <laughs> okay. you need to have a balance of them. So if you're only doing the explorative tasks, you might start to feel quite um, stressed in a way because it requires a lot more energy and thinking. Like, what are you going to do next? What kind of problems or what do you want to achieve? So having those more precise problems is it's nice at some like. It gives variety, for sure. Hello. Hello. Great talk. Uh, I just was wondering, what came first, the concept art for like the tentacles or the tech? That's, that's I'm not sure if I can even answer that. <laughs> because they were both like developing at the same time and we get inspired from one another. So when we see it, okay, the VFX team is doing something like this, we try to think the ways, how can we best incorporate that into our concepts? And the other way around, if they see cool tentacles, they might think, hey, how could I do that in, in game? So it's really hard to say. <laughs> Makes sense. <clears throat> Hey, uh, great talk. Um, I'm a traditional artist who's been doing a lot of 3D generalist things now, and it's been fun. Um, but you mentioned learning your career and then now doing particle simulation. Uh, like, how have you found the balance of learning new tools and tech when also trying to be concept artists and making uh, decisions? Um, so if I understood the question correctly, how do I learn new programs and tech while being a concept artist, right? OK, so I'm a curious person by nature. So I like jumping from program to another. So I have my main programs that I usually use. But yeah, I just like to do it on my free time to go and try how Houdini works or try how this and this new tech works. So I try to incorporate a little bit of new to my personal work and also work that I do at Housemark. So it comes quite naturally. I would say. That's the end of your talk. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah. Yeah.